Here's a math problem about money. I have these 5 cent coins and some 3 cent coins. And someone I know could use a little change, so I was wondering what I can make with them. You can't make a cent, or even 2, but you can definitely make a 3. You can't make 4, but you can make a 5. You can make a 6, but not a 7. And after that, what do you think? Can I make all numbers? If you're given coins of denominations A and B, which numbers can you make as sums of them? This is called the Frobenius coin problem. In our example, I can't make 7, and we will see that this is the largest number I cannot make. So in this case, we will call 7 the Frobenius number of 3 and 5. In this video, we will see how we can find this Frobenius number for A and B in general, and we are going to do this by giving an algorithm instead of an abstract proof. After we are done with that, we'll apply this result to prime factorizations, and we'll prove a theorem about a special class of numbers called powerful numbers. Before we get into the algorithm, let's do a small review of modular arithmetic. Yes, the clock thing that every math video talks about. When we divide a number a by b, then we get a quotient and a remainder. If the remainder is r, then we write it like this, which we read out as a is congruent to r modulo b. Throughout this video, we will assume that a and b are coprime. That is, they share no factors. If they did, you could not make infinitely many numbers using them. Think about what happens when you have a coin of 4 and a coin of 6. For the algorithm, the main thing that we'll need to know and which I will not prove in this video, is that if you have an a modulo b, then there is some number z such that a times z is congruent to 1 modulo b. As an example, consider 7 modulo 9. Multiplying it by 2 gives us 7 times 2, which is 14, and it leaves the remainder 5 when divided by 9. Multiplying it by 3 gives 21, which leaves the remainder of 3 when divided by 9. And multiplying by 4 gives us 28, which, ta-da, has a remainder of 1. So, we say that 7 and 4 are inverses modulo 9. In general, if a and b are coprime, then a has an inverse modulo b. Take my word for it. Or if you want a proof, you can look up Bezu's lemma. It's time for the algorithm now. What we want is to use x many coins of denomination a and y many coins of denomination b to make some number n. We can write this as n equals ax plus by. To make matters simpler, we'll assume b is smaller than a. We look at this equation and take it modulo b. b divided by b gives us the remainder of 0, so this term disappears. We know that a has an inverse, and so we multiply that on both sides, which gives us x congruent to a inverse times n modulo b. The first step of the algorithm basically makes this congruence and equals by asking us to pick the smallest number, which is congruent to a inverse n modulo b. Life is incomplete without examples, so here's one. Let a be 11 and b be 6. Suppose we want to write 70 as 11x plus 6y. Then we first take modulus 6 both sides, which gives us 70 modulus 6, which is 4, and 11 modulus 6, which is 5. And so we have 4 is congruent to 5x modulus 6. The inverse of 5 modulus 6 is 5 itself, and multiplying this on both sides cancels out the 5, and this gives us x is congruent to 20 modulo of 6. But this number is too big, and so we pick the smallest number, which is 2, and thus x is equal to 2. After the first step, we plug in the value of x in the original equation, and then solve for y. In our example, we get 6y equals 70 minus 22, which gives y equals 8. And that's pretty much it. This algorithm can also tell you when a number cannot be expressed as such a sum. For example, if we run our algorithm on 31 for 11 and 6, we get x equals 5, which gives y equals negative 4, a negative number, such heresy. So anytime our algorithm outputs a negative value for y, we will know that for that n, we cannot express it as a sum of coins. So what's the largest number that cannot be expressed? Well, what do we know about x and y? x has to be less than b, but not negative because it's a remainder. And as we cannot express n, y must be a negative value. As we want the final number to be as large as possible, we only have the choice to pick x as b minus 1 and y as minus 1. This gives us the Frobenius number for a and b, which is a b minus a minus b. But my algorithm, however cute and wonderful, is not the ultimate algorithm. What if someone out there has an even better algorithm, which allows them to express a b minus a minus b as a sum of a and b coins? So, as a status check, we know that every number bigger than a, b minus a minus b can be expressed as a coin sum using our algorithm. So all we have to show is that a, b minus a minus b cannot be expressed 
under any algorithm. Suppose it was possible that we had a b minus a minus b equals a x plus b y. We can again use modular arithmetic on this, taking modulo b. Then the terms containing b disappear and we get minus a is congruent to a times x modulo b, which then becomes x is congruent to minus 1 modulo b. Writing this as a remainder, we get x is congruent to b minus 1 modulo b. Doing the same process for y gives y is congruent to a minus 1 modulo a. As x and y are both not negative, y must be at least a minus 1 and x must be at least b minus 1. And so this gives us a nice inequality where ax plus by is at least a times b minus 1 plus b times a minus 1. Doing some manipulations and cancelling gives us that ab is less than or equal to 0, which is preposterous. And so our initial assumption must be wrong. And that shows that the Frobenius number of a and b is really a b minus a minus b. Something to keep in mind, that this expression is the same as a minus 1 times b minus 1 minus 1. Now let's use this theorem for our own nefarious purposes. Given a number, we can find its prime factorization. We call a number powerful if each prime factor appears more than once in the factorization, which means that the power of each prime factor are at least 2. The theorem says if n is a powerful number, then we can write it as f squared times g cubed for some numbers f and g. We can prove this by first showing that p to the r for some prime p can be expressed as a product of a square and a cube. Once we do that, we can take the prime factorization of n, collect up all the squares and the cubes to give us f and g. If p to the r is equal to some f square times g cubed, then we can see that f and g can only be divisible by some prime p and nothing else. So we get that f is p to the x and b is p to the y. Plugging these back in, we see that p to the r is p to the 2x times p to the 3y. And hey, what do you know? This just becomes a question of finding x and y such that 2x plus 3y is equal to r. And from the Frobenius coin problem, we know that every number larger than 1 can be expressed as a sum of 2s and 3s. I've put an example in the description. Turns out it's actually possible to make this theorem even more powerful. So we had that all powers were at least 2, right? We call them 2 full numbers. What about in general r full numbers? So like numbers where each prime factor appear at least r times. Given an r full number n, can we write it as some f to the power a times g to the power b? If you trace your step backwards, then you would realize that this is just like asking the question when is r minus 1 of Frobenius number of a and b? And these are just the solutions to the equation r equals a minus 1 times b minus 1. We simply pick one divisor of r and then add 1 to it to get a, and similarly we get b. Let's close this out with an example. Given an 18 full number, I first factorize 18 to get 3 times 6, and so a is 4 and b is 7, which means any 18 full number can be written as f to the 4th times g to the 7th. And if you had picked another factorization, say 9 times 2, then we could write them as f to the 3 times g to the 10th. Powerful numbers are really fun, and there are some special powerful numbers which we'll talk about next time. Thanks for watching.